Now my haere mai, kia ora tato, and welcome to the sixth episode in the Auckland Writers Festival Winter Series. Ko Paula Morris, toko ingoa, my name is Paula Morris, and I'm speaking to you from my international headquarters, i.e. my flat in Grays Avenue, Auckland. Thanks as ever to our generous technical partner, Auckland Live, and to Copyright Licensing New Zealand for their support in making this series possible. We have three writers in today's episode and we'll meet them in just a moment. Remember that the books we're discussing today are available for sale or order. Just click on the buy the book link in the episode description. Now, during this hour, I'll chat with each of our writers about their latest book. We'll hear a short reading and toward the end of the episode, all three writers will return for a final question or two. You are very welcome to make comments or ask questions throughout the episode. Just use the chat functions on Facebook or YouTube, and I'll try to include your questions if we have time. Uh, two quick final reminders, the series is free to view. So if anyone asks you for credit card information, please ignore them. And do not click on any links in the comments unless those links are supplied by the Auckland Writers Festival. So let us welcome our writers. Kia ora and good morning to Sue Copsey and her guys as Olivia Hayfield. Kia ora Sue. Kia ora Paula. Thank you very much for having me this morning. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, joining us from London, from the Irish bit of London, as he said, Peter Stanford. Kia ora, Peter. Kia ora. Hello. Very nice to be with you. Thank you. And joining us from Wellington, that mysterious place to our south. Kia ora and welcome, Elizabeth Knox. Kia ora, Paula. Not, not feeling very mysterious this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, because we're all about clarity. Now, welcome to you all, Peter and Elizabeth. Uh, um, I look forward to talking to you both a little bit later, so please disappear magically, but do not go far. Now, our first guest this morning has two names, and we'll try to keep them straight. Many of you will know her by her real name, Sue Copsey, an award-winning writer of fiction and non-fiction for children, including The Ghosts of Tarawira. But two years ago, Sue went rogue and wrote a novel for adults under the pseudonym Olivia Hayfield. That book is Wife to Wife, a sharp and witty novel about the life and marriages of Henry VIII, if he were a 21st century womanizing media mogul. In the novel, we meet Harry Rose, super rich and powerful, living in London, who's just married wife number six. But there's no happy ever after for Harry, and history, as we know, may not be on his side. Whether you're a fan of the Tudors or succession, this novel will delight. Kia ora, Sue, and welcome again. Kia ora. Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> That's all right, Sue. Now, listen, I grew up obsessed with the wives of Henry VIII. Oh. So I'm delighted you found a way to cut the Tudors loose from their shifts and their doublets and even work in a mention of the bone people. And I wondered, are you also a long time Tudor obsessive? Oh, for sure, yes. Um, I think it started for me when I went on a school trip to see Anne of the Thousand Days. I don't know if you remember that movie. Um, it was a long time ago. and. I was absolutely outraged um, by Henry VIII at the time and um, it stayed with me all those years and I guess it, it kind of set off my um, obsession with the Tudors and you know when I was a teenager there, there was no such thing as YA so I would just hoover up all the historical novels in, in the library so it was very much a sort of Jean Plady type um, knowledge of the Tudors so um, when I was researching this book I, I tried to sort of use um, more academic um, sources as well as all the, the historical novels and the, the Tudor TV series and so on that, that I've watched over the years. Yes. I absolutely love Jean Plady growing up, I have to tell you. Sometimes I, I miss those days of whole weekends of Jean Plady novels. I'm glad oh. you, you're a fan as well. Yes, I was. So would you mind taking us through the names of Harry Rose's six wives in your novel and a little about the the contemporary personas you created for them? Yeah, so um, Harry's first wife is uh, Catherine of Aragon, I recreated as Katie Paragon. So that was a bit of a gift because she is, of course, this paragon of virtue, very saintly, deeply religious, um, lots of fertility 
um, problems, which leads to her depression, which poor Harry can't cope with at all, being a bit of a snowflake. Um, so yes, she is this lovely, classy, quiet, intelligent, strong woman that suffers from um, depression and fertility. And then we move on to Anna uh, Libon. That's just a straightforward anagram, obviously, of Anne Boleyn. Um, again, very easy to recreate in, in modern day, a very, very strong character, very ambitious. The big difference between her and her 16th century equivalent is that she won't stand for this appalling behavior for the philandering of her husband. Um, so that I, without giving away too much, that's kind of a, a different outcome for her. Um, she stands up to, to her husband's terrible behavior. And then we move on to Jane Seymour, who's recreated as uh, Jeanette Morrissey. Um, I couldn't actually find an awful lot about Jane Seymour to like. She was a, a bit kind of meek and um, I couldn't, yes, there wasn't a lot to redeem her. So the best I could do with my 20, 20th century equivalent was to kind of make her very sweet and kind and nice and a good mum. Um, she obviously doesn't last too long because the, the plot does mirror, mirror history. So we move on to um, Anki from Cleveland, who is Anne of Cleves. So immediately I had to think of an equivalent because Henry VIII married her on the basis of a portrait. So the online thing immediately came to mind. I was originally going to have her as an internet bride, but then I decided on an avatar instead, who um, Harry eventually meets. And of course, she's nothing like her online equivalent. But that, that all ends very amicably as it did in history. And we move on to the wild child, Catherine Howard, who's recreated as Caitlin Howe. Um, and it seemed to me that I could make her a, a reality TV star. She was very flighty, but she had Catherine Howard had an absolutely appalling upbringing. And I mean, by today's standards, she was abused. You know, she was a teen when she had these relationships which brought her down eventually with Henry VIII. So I tried to make her quite an empathetic character and see things from her point of view. Um, tragic character, um, very fragile. Uh, again, I don't want to give too much away, but it doesn't end well. And then we move on to um, Henry VIII's sixth wife, Catherine Parr, who in history was quite formidable, very intelligent. She was the first woman in English history to have a book published under her own name. In fact, she had two. So she, she was an amazing woman, very strong, very intelligent. So I've recreated her as the person that finally brings Harry Rose back on track, um, gets his health under control, uh, makes him face up to his past, um, problems, um, faces conscience, if you like. So all of the characters very much mirror their historical equivalents. Absolutely. Also, I mean, you have, you, you're very playful with, with other characters as well. I'm thinking about your portrayal of the ruthless lawyer, Tom Cranwell, who's not quite as sympathetic as Hilary Mantel's version of Thomas Cromwell. Are there any surprising heroes and villains in your rendition of this world? Um, I think the, the character, the Thomas More character, I decided that I would recreate Thomas More as a, as a woman. And I guess out of all the characters, she would be Harry Rose's antagonist, the one that makes him face up to his conscience. And I deliberately made her a working class character that who, who had clawed her way to the top by standing up to Harry's behavior. Um, so she's really the only one who will answer him back and um, she's quite fearsome and she's probably my favourite character in the book um, and I've had very good response to her. Um, I wish now that I'd made more of the, the Cranwell character. Um, he's kind of a little bit two dimensional and I reread Wolf Hall with the mirror and the light coming out and I, the way that Hilary Mantel portrays him. I wish I'd kind of put a little bit more subtlety in like that, but he, he serves more of a purpose. He's more of a person to move the plot along really. And Catherine Howard 
um, storyline. And of course, Tom Cram Thomas Cromwell wasn't around by the time <laughs> Catherine Howard um, met her demise. So there, I have played fast and loose with history a little bit there. I mean, as you say, you, you have a lot of story to include in here because your story covers three decades, doesn't it, from 1985 to 2018. Yeah. And there's a lot of pop culture references from Band-Aid through to the Charles Diana divorce, the yeah. Me Too movement. And I wondered if you saw the book in a way as a portrait of our era as well. I mean, of our own foolish gilded age. Um, foolish and gilded, yes. I guess it was almost an excuse for me to relive my youth. Um, <laughs> I very much enjoyed putting all the pop culture references, but to me, I, when I'm, as a reader, I always like to know where I am in time and as well as my setting. So I, I put them in originally as, as anchors to show where we were in the storyline rather than having to spell it out all the time. But I actually found that, um, that it was working really nicely having those little pop culture references. Um, and I have in the reviews, people have picked those up and said how much they enjoyed them, which was nice because I know as an, as an editor, you're often taking those things out because you don't want books to date. But to me, it was very important that Harry was a product of his time. He was very much that hooray Henry city in the eighties when it was completely awash with money. Um, so, yes, I wanted him to be that 1980s hooray Henry type, if you like. Now, you're going to read us a little bit um, from the book. Now, it's not the 80s, it's the 90s, is that right? When Harry's turning 30? That's Would you right. like to read for us, please? Yes. So it's June 1993. Harry was walking the short distance to Hampton Court Station on his way to catch the 725 into Waterloo. Already, already the day was warm. It looked like his 30th birthday was going to be a scorcher. Katie had still been asleep when he'd left. She'd almost kicked the antidepressants and the sleeping pills, but it still took her a while to get out of bed in the mornings. He bought a copy of the Times and stood in his usual spot on the northbound platform. Dotted around were other commuters, the men in similar suits to his own, cheaper versions, obviously, reading the same newspapers they read every day. Many faces were familiar. They were the same people he saw each time he caught the 725. The only difference today was that most had taken the risk of going umbrella free. He had a sudden memory of driving to work from the Fulham house in his red TVR, top down, music blaring. Now look at him like Mr. Banks from Mary Poppins. All that was missing was the bowler hat. He was 30. The train clattered into the station and he made his way to his usual seat, then read the same paragraph on the front page of the newspaper three times before registering he was taking none of it in. He lowered the paper and stared out of the window. 30 years old. What was he doing with his life? Work-wise, everything was going swimmingly. He was pleased with his teams, leaner and meaner after last December's purge. Company profits were now so healthy, they were looking at diversifying, and Harry was considering moving Rose Corps to new premises. He'd be hands-on with the design, maybe a tower, something like Canary Wharf, but taller. His personal life was a shambles, however. He needed to do something about it. Katie would always hold a special place in his heart, but the love was gone. All that remained was a vague fondness, which gave way to exasperation whenever they attempted a where to next conversation. Katie wanted them to have relationship counselling and prayed for guidance, which made Harry more annoyed. He wanted to move on, but Katie became so upset when he suggested living apart for a while that inevitably he backed down, fearing sending her back to the darkest days of her depression. So things stayed as they were, going nowhere. As for Mary, the sooner he could shake her off, the better. The breathy voice he'd once found so alluring now set his teeth on edge. Meanwhile, his obsession with Anna had strengthened its grip. He'd been biding his time. Would his gamble pay off? 
He'd felt sure Percy's exile to Dublin would be the catalyst for a meltdown in that relationship. Anna was hugely ambitious. Any fool could see that. She wasn't going to give up her skyrocketing career for art editor of Catholic Weekly or Irish Homes and Gardens or whatever the good people of Dublin like to read. Would she and Percy go the long distance relationship route, only meeting up at weekends? Harry's guess was they'd give that a try. If they did, he'd intensify his campaign. She'd be bored during the week. Perhaps they could make up a regular four with Charles and Meghan on the tennis court again. And he'd instigate plenty of late nights at the office, late nights with input from himself. He shifted in his seat as the image of Anna's dark, deep brown eyes and willowy body filled his head. She'd be his, he was certain. He just needed to time it right, plan it carefully. Harry smiled. There really was nothing like the thrill of the chase. That's it. Kia ora, Sue, thank you very much. And Mary here, of course, is Mary Boleyn right. and sister with whom Harry has an affair. Indeed, yes. yes. <laughs> now, a little later in the book, um, there's a quote about Caitlin, the Catherine Howard character, and it's, it's difficult to shed your past. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's true of us all now, but with the internet and the media, and of course, it has, both those things have a vital role in the novel, though there's no equivalent in the Tudor era. And I wondered, is the media in your novel, the new church, there to monitor us, to judge us, to hold us to account? Yes, for sure. Um, I, when I recreated um, Henry as Harry Rose, I decided not to have him as a, a politician. And I was thinking about, you know, where the power really lies now. And for sure, I thought it, it's the media, you know, the media has taken over that role as some, um, I don't know, the, the kind of commentator on our lives, um, the big influencer. So yes, I guess it has taken over from, from the church in that respect, yeah. Your novel's subtitle is Karma Versus Redemption. And I wonder, do you personally believe in those things? Uh, I'm kind of a, a little bit on the fence. I, I do think there's an element of, of fate in our lives. Um, with, with Originally with this book, I was set out to give Henry VIII his comeuppance. I thought it was about time that someone did, um, but as I was researching him, I actually realized there was a lot more depth to this character. And so maybe I should give him a little bit more of a, a chance at redemption. And that carries on in, into the sequel, um, the second book. So we see him on this long, long journey to try and <laughs> redeem himself from this appalling man that he was in the 16th century into um, a more of an enlightened 21st century man. So, I mean, you can't quite bring yourself to kill him off, right? I, I, as I say, originally, I just, I hated this man. He was, he was, you know, the, the two dimensional obese tyrant, the caricature, Henry VIII, chucking the chicken legs over his shoulder. Um, but when I started to research him at the beginning of his reign, he was like this amazing Renaissance man, um, a deep thinker, very intelligent, um, very well read and he was destined for a, a career in the church of course until his elder brother died and then he and eventually inherited the throne and so my big question was what turned this paragon of virtue this amazing vain egotistical but basically good guy into this awful horrible obese tyrant that we all love to hate so I was looking at those influences and thinking, you know, if those influences were different today, particularly, um, you know, his health issues wouldn't be such a big thing. The women in his life would be stronger, would have more of an influence on him and he wouldn't have the absolute power. So he's a much more sort of toned down version. And I also needed a reason um, for readers to stay on side with him. So I had to make him more appealing and I needed all these strong women because I wanted my 20th century versions to be strong. Um, uh, they needed a reason to stick with him and to want to, to help him on his journey to redemption. So I had to make him a lot more appealing than, than Henry. 
Now, this novel is Wife After Wife. What will the sequel be? Um, the sequel is called Sister to Sister, and it follows uh, it, the early years of Elizabeth I's reign, um, Elizabeth I being Harry's daughter, Eliza, who is very much a millenn millennial um, girl. So it, it starts off with her uh, at Oxford University, um, ready to take over. And in the meantime, her sister, uh, the Mary Tudor reincarnation, um, Maria is in charge and is trying to rid Rose Corps of sleaze. So that's the kind of the parallel to history. So we immediately have plenty of conflict between the enlightened millennial girl, Eliza, and the kind of much more serious, um, deeply religious sister, Maria. Um, and then it moves on and we have the, the romance with uh, the Robert Dudley character, the conflict with the Mary Queen of Scots character. And I also looked at um, Elizabethans who I was interested in. And of course, Shakespeare and Marlowe jumped out at me. So I have them as her, her friends, two absolutely wonderful characters who are writing scripts for Eliza's um, new branch of Rose Corps, which is like a, a Netflix equivalent. So we branch out into <laughs> subscription TV <laughs> in the sequel. This sounds really great, Sue. Listen, it's been really wonderful to talk to you and I look forward to bringing you back into the conversation a little later in this episode. Kia ora thank and you thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Our next guest this morning is Peter Stanford, a noted journalist, travel writer and biographer, former editor of the Catholic Herald and a respected commentator on, religious, on religion and ethics. Peter's books include The Devil, a biography, and Judas, The Troubling History of the Renegade Apostle. His latest book is Angels, A Visible and Invisible History, a wide-ranging exploration of the origins of angels in religious thought, history, art, the wider culture, it's both erudite and accessible. And I'm reminded of the way Catherine Nixie of the Times once described the author. Peter Stanford, she wrote, deserves to have his route to heaven eased, not by indulgences, but by virtue of the fact that he is so tremendously entertaining. Tēnā koe, Peter, welcome. Hello, God, no, uh, no pressure then to be entertaining this evening. <laughs> or this morning, sorry, your morning, I'm evening, yeah, sorry. Get my timelines right. I'm really, I'm sorry, Peter's obviously drunk as uh, as all our British guests are. Don't worry about oh, it. Peter. Oh, we're all locked in. Joking. There's something to do. <laughs> I am joking. Now, Peter, you confront cliches about angels in this book. You discuss them as disruptive often rather than benign. And in fact, you point out near the beginning of the book that the angels guarding Eden are hostile. As you say, their role is to punish humans. What drew you to write about angels and really explore their diversity rather than the Christmas card picture of them? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I grew up Catholic. Uh, I still am, sort of. Um, uh, uh, I grew up Catholic in, uh, in Liverpool, which is, which is the, uh, where, where most Irish Catholics come from. So very traditional. And I grew up with angels. So we used to say the, those prayers about our guardian angels every evening as we, um, as we went to bed uh, about my guardian dear. Um, I suppose much more specifically for me, um, my mum was disabled and uh, and uh, used a wheelchair, so a lot of the a lot of my childhood was was her sort of struggling with this, and she used to take all sorts of kind of crazy risks. Really, she uh, she had this car that she was meant to take her wheelchair out in with her, and she always used to leave it behind on the drive. And my dad, who was slightly pessimistic, it would be fair to say, was always saying to her, "You know, you can't do that. Someone will steal the wheelchair." And she would always say, "But my guardian angels will watch over it." And she did it for 15 years and no one ever took the wheelchair away. So we believed in guardian angels. So it was just, it was as simple as that. And I suppose a lot of the things that I've written about, you, you, you mentioned some of them before, were things that I kind of, ideas that I grew up with, religious ideas that I grew up with. And, and you get to a stage in your life, you think, well, what, what, what do I think about them as a grown up? Was that all just kind of childish whimsy or was it something more? Um, and I suppose one of the things that struck me very, very strongly with angels was I, I, I write for a, a newspaper in England called the Daily Telegraph. And I was sent along to interview a woman called Lorna Byrne, an Irish woman who, um, who wrote a book called um, Angels, in, angels in My Hair. So she was talking about having always seen guardian angels since she was, since she was a child. 
and I, I interviewed her, found her quite interesting, was then asked to do an event a bit like this, but on stage, when, when we still could do things uh, with, the, with the public in the room with us. And I was absolutely flabbergasted, huge hall in the middle of London, 800 people turned up, listened to her talking about seeing guardian angels. The most striking thing was at the end, nobody left. They all waited and they all wanted to talk to her. So being a, a sort of prying sort of journalist, I, I was talking to people in the queue saying, why? why, why, why do you want to talk about this? And they were all saying, she talks about something that I believe in too, i.e. The, the people in the hall, and no one talks about it anymore. So I thought, does no one talk about angels? So I went off and, and looked in some of the sort of, you know, sociological research. Certainly in Britain, the figures are one in three people believe they have a guardian angel, one in three. And one in 10 people say they've had a personal experience of an angel. So my mother would have been in the one in three, the, the, but one in 10 people saying they've, they've actually met an angel. Now, if you think about it, I think you know the same studies will show us that about 25% of people in this country uh, say they have a strong or fairly strong belief in God. So angels are suddenly more popular than God. I mean, I'm not very good at maths, but one in three, I think is 33%, correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, against 25%. So, you know, the origin of the word angel in Hebrew and in Greek is as messenger. Angels were messengers of God, but actually the messengers are becoming the message as far as that was. So um, I suppose what got me going was what's going on. The other fascinating thing, again, this is this country, and obviously we're all bonkers in this country, particularly at the moment. Uh, but the other thing that, um, that uh, not as bonkers as America, but hey, let's not go there. Uh, but um, uh, the other thing that fascinated me in those figures was one in, one in seven atheists in this country said they believed in angels. And you just thought, what is that about? So that's really where I started. So I looked back through history, and then I was, I suppose, and I started to, to understand where we are now and found in a way that we are on a, on a continuum. So the book is really looking back through that history. And you are absolutely right. You know, if you go back to, well, certainly in, in Western Christian society, where do we get, where do we first see angels in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures? First angel we meet is the cherubim on the gates of the Garden of Eden, and has, who's been put there once Adam and Eve have been kicked out to stop anyone else coming back in. So the angel is the security guard as opposed to a security blanket, which is what we think of as guardian angels now. You know, you've got all those angels helping, helping the Jews bring down the walls of Jericho. You've got the, uh, the angels who come and kill 85,000 Assyrians at uh, one stage in the Old Testament. You know, they're, they're pretty grisly characters. You, you wouldn't really want to meet them on a, on a kind of dark night. And, yet, and, and, and clearly, again, in the, in the, certainly in the Christian tradition, where they borrow it from Judaism to an extent, uh, the, the, the bad angels, the devil, the devil and the watcher angels, those ideas. And somehow we've managed to morph over 2000 years to this idea that we only have these rather cuddly angels. So what, how have we done that? So the book traces all those things through the Renaissance, how angels have been used in terms of ecclesiastical power, how the church wanted to um, buttress its authority with the authority of angels, how people like Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages looking at angels thought that angels held the key to the universe. If you could understand how angels operated, you'd understand how the universe operated. Renaissance angels, very, very human like us. Sorry, I mean, I'm going to tell you the whole book if I'm not careful, um, <laughs> but I'm not be entertaining at all. And as you said at the beginning, so I'm going to stop now. Um, I mean, your book is really fascinating in its historical context because you also talk about angels in Islam as well as the Judeo-Christian tradition. You talk about the influence of Babylon and Greece. And you also said something that I found very interesting that often our contemporary notion of what angels look like actually has its roots in Persia and Zoroastrianism. And I wonder if you talk just a little bit about that, Peter, before I ask you to do your reading. Yeah, so if you, uh, as I say, if you start at the beginning, well, first of all, let's, 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 let's mention is Islam for sort. Islam has many more angels than any other creed. I think one of the, again, one of the problems in Western culture is we have this incredibly negative view of Islam, um, for, you know, for, for very obvious reasons. But actually, if you go back and read the Quran and you read the Hadith, you know, a wonderful kind of rich culture uh, of all the three great monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, much, much, a much richer tradition of angels than us. And of course, no accident then, because it was 
uh, Islam in the seventh century replaced Zoroastrianism. So go back to, I've just talked about those nasty angels at the beginning of the Old Testament. Uh, something changes and it changes around the time that the Jews were defeated and went into exile in Babylon. So uh, 597 uh, BC, Jews defeated, go to, to, uh, uh, go to Babylon. Um, what, what do they come across there? They come across Zoroastrianism, the dominant religion at the time. What Zoroastrianism had, um, and we'll all recognize this from our idea of angels, is they talk, they had um, a, a, a group of angels called Fravashi, who uh, uh, they, they were, they were, they're described in the holy books of Zoroastrianism as walking along the ramparts of heaven and coming down to look after people when they're in danger. I mean, there is your guardian angel. There it is, 500 BC, it, it is absolutely there. Uh, they also have um, a group of angels, so the, the, Zoroastrianism was dualist, uh, um, yeah, dualist, so you had a good god and a bad god. Um, and so around the good god, who is called Ahura Mazda, uh, like, like the light bulbs, um, they, um, they had, uh, he had six um, divine spirits who are like archangels. So there's your archangel idea. Those, you know, in Christianity, we only have three archangels. Uh, Gabriel, Raphael, and Michael. Uh, occasionally you're allowed, allowed um, Uriel as well. It's a bit like the, the fifth Beatle. No one really mentions him very much. So we're only really allowed those three. Um, uh, so they have that idea. And also they have, the, even to this day, the symbol of Iran, because um, Zoroastrianism was very much based around Babylon, what we would now call I Iran. Um, the symbol of Iran to this day is the Faravar, and um, unfortunately, because I'm sitting in front of a camera, I quite, can't quite do it, but it's half man, half beast, and he has his arms stretched out either way, very, very elongated arms. That is the symbol now, An another angel figure, a winged, a winged creature figure. So the Jews go there, um, and what they decide is... They can't understand why God has abandoned them. God, who's Yahweh, who's looked after them, made them win every fight, has abandoned them. How do they get back in favour with God? They get back in favour with God by going through intermediaries, going through angels. So it's in the latter part of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, when they come back from um, exile, that you get all these wonderful angels coming. It's where you get uh, the uh, archangel Michael, and Gabriel come up in the book of Daniel, which is in all Catholic, Protestant, uh, Christian Bibles. Um, Catholics in particular are very fond of a book called the book of Tobit, which has wonder, a wonderful story, which I can't tell you now because it would take too long. But the archangel Raphael comes there dis uh, uh, disguised as a slave. And, and it's actually, if actually someone's done it already, I was going to say for our novelist here, uh, but Sally Vickers did a book called Miss Garnet's Angel, which tells that story. So those wonderful, wonderful stories. Then along comes Christianity. Of course, Christianity borrows most of its ideas from Judaism and borrows the angel idea. That's why we've got the angels we've got. Now, obviously, your book goes into some very interesting discussions of, of more recent things. Like I was particularly interested in discussion of angels in the work of Paul Clay and, and Mark Chagall. But I wondered if you would give us your reading now, Peter, which I think you said is going to come from the epilogue of the book. Um, would you, where you talk about your own personal engagement with angels, would you mind reading that, please? Yes, I, I, I chose this book because the two things that people have asked me um, uh, when I've been researching and writing the book is why, I mean, why, why are you doing it? Uh, and what drew, and, and, and what, and do I believe? Do you believe in angels? Uh, believe is a really interesting word. What do you mean by believe? So I just thought if I en um, ended this, this bit with this little bit from the epilogue, it kind of links me in with it. So, my local church, St. Mary's in South Creek is where I go to spend time with angels. It has stood largely untouched since the 15th century in North Norfolk. Smiling down from the hammer beams of the angel roof are two rows of carvings of winged heavenly creatures, each one carrying musical instruments and reminders of Jesus's crucifixion. Though it defies logic, they feel to me like friends, and not just because their benign gaze represents a kind of continuity, that chain that links us as tiny specks backwards and forwards in human history. What strikes me most about these angels on every visit is their democracy. They're there for everyone, regardless of creed, rank or belief. They're amused, expectant beams never asking anything in return. Many ancient churches, cathedrals, monasteries and convents were designed to reflect the man-made hierarchies. But these angels on the ceiling were just as available to the sinners in the back row, that's me, and the saints in the front. 
One way the Christian church responded to the challenge posed to its waning authority by first the scientific revolution of the 17th century and then the enlightenment of the 18th with their mantras of proof and reason was to insist ever more loudly that the details found in the scriptures and especially true. That way they too could pass the proof test. But of course they can't. That was never the point of these narratives. They were and are a different kind of truth, poetic, emotional, and very human, and angels are part of that tradition. I've lost count while researching and writing this book of how many times I've been asked if I believe in angels. Can you really tell me, a distinguished oncologist I met at a party demanded when he'd winkled out of me that I was writing about angels, that the angel Gabriel was there at the Annunciation telling Mary she was going to have God's child. Of course I couldn't, no more than I could produce a feather from an angel's wing or a broken string from a celestial harp. What I can prove though, is that people have in their own way however inimical it is to today's orthodoxy, believed in angels over millennia and continue to do so. There are many words, not all of them approving, that are used to describe the enduring hankering for the presence of angels. Need, wish fulfillment, brainwashing by the churches, a ch childlike desire for an invisible best friend that we really ought to have grown out of. Or, for those who haven't, the adult variation that, the, that likes the idea of a superman of unknown origin, but impe unimpeachable goodness, who sweeps in and sorts out our messes. All whimsy, meaningless superstition, don't dismiss it so lightly. Like poetry, angels touch on the elusive, potentially transcendent something that is found or not found in beauty, in life, in the possibility that somewhere out there, there is what we might call an unknown almost. Just close enough for us to feel its presence instinctively, but also just beyond our grasp. And like poetry, angels talk to spirit, not body. The within, not the without. The metaphysical, not the physical. The invisible, not the visible. That has been their role through history. Today, angels are more likely than ever to be working on an individual basis, outside the systems and structures of institutional religion. In moments of grief and loss, of inexplicable suffering and torment, of danger, of terror, of desperation or despair at existence itself, angels continue to provide a way of articulating the hope that something inexplicable will step in and save us. Insofar as angels can ever, sa ever satisfy so great a demand, they don't come with explanations and they don't make demands. At their simplest, the story of angels is the power of love, the best of humanity, sometimes found at precisely those moments when we're confronted by the worst of what we have to face or do to each other. Their story then is part of ours. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, in preparation for our conversation today, I, I rewatched the Wim Wenders film, Wings of oh, Display. Yes. Talk about it in relation to Rilke and his Duino allergies, and both works interrogate that tension between the visible and the invisible that you just mentioned. And I wondered, do you think, is this the same tension that exists within faith and its embrace of mystery, the concept of mystery? Well, look, the, the, you know, when we use the word believe now in the 21st century, we, we assume that you can only believe things that you can put in a test tube and prove to exist. I mean, you know, and I'm really, really not in any way damning science. You know, years ago, I wrote a book about the devil. And in the, uh, you know, in medieval times, if you had epilepsy, people thought you were possessed by the devil. So three cheers for science. We're, you know, we're living in an age of coronavirus. Three cheers for science. Science is a great thing. But science doesn't have all the answers. And I think, particularly at times of kind of suffering, um, suffering and death, they're the things that, 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 that uh, trouble us most, you know, why young people die, die young, uh, why, you know, all, all those sort of questions. I think what we come face to face with is 
moments of transcendence, that idea that, the cam that there is more to the world than meets the eye, more than that, is, that can be shown in the test tube. And we all have it in lots of different ways in our life. Um, and lots of people, when they have what we might call moments of transcendence, when things happen that science says can't happen, uh, we dismiss them and we, don't, we carry on and we, we have this rational view. Um, but I think, well, certainly for me, I've never seen an angel. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in the one in turn. I believe in, in guardian angels. But I'll just very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you a very brief story and I promise to make it brief. Um, I mentioned before my mum had multiple sclerosis. Uh, she died, she didn't die of multiple sclerosis, she died of cancer about, uh, well, nearly 20 years ago now. So my kids who are 23 and 20 hardly knew her. Now, because we were very Catholic, we went to church every Sunday um, and every other day as well, as far as I can remember. And um, uh, my mum was in a wheelchair, rubber tires, churches with marble floors. The, we, the rubber tires used to make a squeak when they went along. And um, she always had to sit at the end, beyond the end of the bench because they didn't, make it disabled accessible then. Sometimes, very, very, I mean, I miss her. I, I find it very painful that my mother never knew my children. Um, and I, when I talk about them, they sort of slightly I talk about her to them, they glaze over. But sometimes when I was growing up, very, very rarely, this isn't an everyday thing at all. Um, I would be sitting there and I could hear the noise of the rubber tires. I'd be sitting with them in church because obviously like, you know, we all do what we thought we're not going to do with our children. I take my poor children to church. They won't go anymore. But anyway, that's another story. But we, we sit in the bench. We sat in the bench with them and I heard the rubber tires and I knew she was there. I knew she was there. I don't mean this in a kind of wishy-washy way. I knew physically she was there. I also knew that if I turned and looked, she wouldn't be there. And that's the tension. There's your visible and invisible. Um, I, you know, you could choose to dismiss it, you could say it was wish fulfillment, you could say I'd had too much to drink the night before, you could say whatever you wanted, but for me I knew that feeling was true. That was a moment of transcendence. Angels are about those moments of transcendence. It's about when people are, are open to the idea there's something more to the world than meets the eye, this, this metaphysical, this invisible dimension. That, that's what I think it's about. That's really fantastic, Peter. And it's actually a really good segue into talking to Elizabeth. But I do have one viewer question. I just want to ask you really quickly. I don't know if you can just give me a yes or no answer. <laughs> viewer wants to know, would you call Avalokiteshvara an angel as well? The, the, the definition of angel is very broad. So, you know, when I talk about kind of transcendence, it, it can fill in all sorts of other things. It's feeling a presence in a room. It's what some people call ghosts, what some people call, call fairies. It's spirits, sprites, all of those things. It, 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 crosses, it crosses such a wide variety of different things, but it's the same basic, it's an expression of the same basic principle, idea, truth. So, yes. Sorry, that was a very long way of saying yes. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And please join us again at the end of the hour so we can all talk together again as a group. Thank you so much, Peter. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, our third guest today, of course, is no stranger to angels. She created the most famous one in New Zealand literature. I'm talking, of course, about Elizabeth Knox and her award-winning novel, The Vintner's Luck. Elizabeth is the author of more than a dozen novels and one of our leading exponents of what she calls fantastic naturalism. She has won numerous awards and in the recent Queen's Birthday Honours was made a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Her latest novel is The Absolute Book, a page-turning story set in contemporary England and New Zealand as well as in purgatory and a magical fairyland that Elizabeth unsurprisingly makes all her own. It's been compared with Philip Pullman's His Dark Material books and Pip Adams calls it, Pip Adam calls it a triumph of fantasy. Tēnā koe Elizabeth and welcome. Kia ora. So I'm not, I'm not weeping Elizabeth at the sight of you, I just for some reason. Oh no, I don't know. it's a he crazy me, day. He, just, yeah, and no, Peter just made me tear up so. <laughs> So let's talk about your book. I mean, it's such a rich story about stories in a way. Books and libraries lie at its heart. And one of your main characters, Taryn Cornick, has her own book called The Feverish Library. Now you've described the absolute book as an arcane thriller. And I wonder if you could explain to viewers, what does that mean? Well, um, it's one of the things it is, but that was the that was a way into the story for me. Uh, uh, I began thinking, I began by thinking about what I loved about what 
what I call and other people call arcane thrillers, which is um, like uh, something like the Da Vinci Code, a book where a scholarly hero is looking for something and the something is arcane and mysterious. Um, so in this book, Taryn Cornick discovers that this there's a there's a a scroll box called the fire starter that has always been in her life because it was once in her grandfather's library and she discovers that she's mentioned it in a footnote in her book though she's forgotten that she's mentioned it because the fire starter itself has the kind of has the ability to make people forget it so and that draws all sorts of interest to her now one of the things that I used to um both really enjoy and it would frustrate me was when uh, a, an arcane thriller sort of hinted at the supernatural but then in the end the supernatural doesn't amount to much so I just thought well I was just going to this would be begin as if it was an arcane thriller and there would turn into a fully fledged full-blooded fantasy but there's also a lot of very contemporary geopolitics in the novel as well, like including battles over clean water and climate change. And Taryn talks of a, a shift in how things stand. And it, unlike a dystopian narrative, say, that, that will comment obliquely on the contemporary world, the absolute book is, is explicit with many contemporary references from Google Maps to Nespresso to Peter Jackson. And I wondered how you managed to negotiate those shifts between reality and fantasy in the book uh well i think I, I i i don't feel like i'm negotiating shifts i just feel like i am following the story all the time and i hope that that conveys itself to the reader that um the things i decide to put in and leave out only have to do with what i feel that the characters will be encountering so the the discipline in the book is to kind of um you know to realize that when you're when you're dressing your world with the things that people know about like Nespresso or Peter Jackson that that you that's a sh kind of a shorthand whereas every time that you go into um the the Sid in this the fairyland I had to um I had to carry on the same kind of tone of as if it's shorthand as as if as if um so that it's not doesn't read just like a portal fantasy so the 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 character who enters fairyland for the first time for the second time for the third time who comes from our world isn't always acting like um the naive tourists who have to have everything explained to them but but just have a feeling that everything that's going on around them is what always happens that it's all natural yeah the natural environment at one point, Taryn muses that um, fairy tales are always familiar. But for you as a writer, um, making things fresh and new is something that you absolutely have to do. And I know that you teach classes about world building for fantasy writers. Do you have any advice for other writers or aspiring writers about creating something rich like your novel that draws on myth and religion and literature, but feels original and fresh at the same time? Well, one thing that I tell my students is that uh, the, the book is like a point in time, like a present, and that um, that if you decide upon a, a something, a kind of a, an invention that's going to drive the book, the, the, for instance, if you're looking at Philip Pullman, the fact that people had their souls outside their bodies in the forms of animals, then, then you that invention, you have to sort of make it go backwards in terms of its its um you know its provenance you've got to say where how did that come to be you've got to have some sense of how it came to be but you don't want to get into the turtles all the way down situation and then you also there's a much more practical way in which it goes forward which is the consequences of that invention so for instance in dream hunter and dreamquake people are catching dreams in this place where time seems to have stopped and then they they bring them back and they have a commercial use the dreams they're they're used to entertain people and so therefore it's a kind of a it's a it's a economic it's an economic activity 
and but then it has smaller consequences like because time stopped in the place they catch these dreams it's very dry there so the place where they perform this you know the island where all the performances take place in these big um hotel type opera places also has lots of steam baths because these people are always having to you know rehabilitate their sinuses and so forth so you it's just a layering of invention so that's that's yeah that's pretty much what I try to get my students to be thinking about all the time. Elizabeth, will you read to us from the Absolute Book, please? So this is Jacob. Jacob is um, Jacob's a policeman. Taryn, the 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 heroine of the book, has been um, has has before the book begins, she has lost her sister in a crime of violence and has contrived a revenge. And Jacob is a police policeman with a cold case that relates to her revenge. Uh, and he gets kind of pulled into it, everything that she gets pulled into. And this is him thinking about where, how he comes to be where he is. As a child, the only way Jacob Berger had of recognizing anything as exceptional was by its effect upon his parents. There were only ever faint clues. His family was as dedicated to switching off any upsetting news as they were to keeping the property tidy. They wouldn't show concern at national or international events, only getting worked up when their local council made a section of the high street one way or brought in those clattering bins for curbside recycling. All causes of excitement became alien to young Jacob. Either they were none of his business or they were silly. When he was 12, a visiting aunt complained of Jacob that he had the smug air of having seen everything before. Jacob's problem was that he was unimpressed by what he could see, his provincial suburban existence where unusual movements always counted as going too far so that the neighbor who lost his license after a drink driving conviction was treated perfectly civilly Whereas the one whose unknown griefs drove him to get up in church and shout that God must be mad was shunned, not coldly shunned, only helplessly. The drunk driver's failings were not an embarrassment. The other man's expression of torment was. Teenage Jacob was bored, but he was not above it all. He was never sufficiently at ease or, or firm on his emotional feet for that. He did leave as soon as he was able. And at university, he found things to admire, like other people's enthusiasms, especially in the fun first year when none of them minded their debts and responsible adulthood seemed a long way off. By degrees, Jacob arrived, an adult, in an already decided world, another occupier among many occupiers and few owners. A world where changes of government that caused various of his university friends to tear their hair out seemed to Jacob not much more than the seasonal differences in the taste of milk depending upon the richness of pasture. Matters of governance and regulation were organized reasonably well, as far as he could see, and they might be much worse. Jacob was always able to imagine worse. His gifts were as limited as almost everyone else's. His strongest distinguishing trait was his lifelong restless disdain. He didn't have a calling, only a skill set. He was clever and cool-headed and prepared to do tough things so long as someone he trusted offered him a good enough reason. Jacob's class and temperament pointed him to the police force, to the watchdogs who were also hunting dogs and had more in common with the wolves they prevented than the flock they protected. It suited him to be in li a line of work where he could reflexively relegate a vast majority of people to the status of dim innocents who needed looking after. He enjoyed the game of being a detective, the twists and turns of this target or plot. The things that took a toll on others, like constantly seeing the worst of people or encounter after encounter where the other person was badly frightened, left his temperature unchanged. But lately, Jacob had undergone a troubling alteration in attitude. Instead of enjoying the smug sense that he knew more than the civilians, 
Jacob found himself simply wanting the world to change. And then it did. He recalled the very erudite lawyer he regularly had a drink with explaining to him why the coming referendum wasn't going to devolve into the usual political point scoring, but instead produce something extraordinary. And it's not just Murdoch and immigrants and implied promises about what might be done to save the NHS by the very people dismantling it. It's not just memories of busy shipyards and granddad's self-respect. No, it's an almost mythical yearning, as though, if only we can create the right conditions, a stranger might come out of the mist, thrust a sword into a stone and say, whomsoever draws forth this blade. And now, here Jacob was, having returned from another world, with a much better understanding of the depth of his ignorance concerning what might be yearned for and not be mythical. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. We have a, um, a viewer question uh, for you. Um, a viewer asks, is there a key element or principle that runs through all your wonderful and inventive worlds? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> I am interested in transcendence. I'm interested in the marvelous, much in the same way that um, Margaret Mahi was. She had a sense of the world or yearning for the world as an adventure. And she had a, a yearning for the sense of the marvelous. And I think I'm temperamentally very like that. So I think all my books are try uh, that it's not just that they invent that, that they move to one side of what's there and and say what if and then kind of you know try to delight people with invention it's also that they are absolutely in love with what is there as if what is there the world the the appearances of the world um nature uh, society, the way people behave, human folly, human um, grandeur, as it, if it's, all of it's got light inside it. So, yeah. Um, you, you were talking earlier, a little earlier in our conversation about your, your Dream Hunter books, which were YA novels, YA fantasies, but the absolute book is, is not YA. Did you make a, a decision about writing fantasy for adults this time or was it just the story itself that seemed to demand it well um day life of course is fantasy for adults and um and so is and so is the um the zass box the vintner's luck and the angel's cut so i was just going back to i felt i was going back to my adult fantasy but that i decided that i was writing an epic and i thought well i'll have a go at an epic but then i very quickly realized that the kind of things I liked that were epic were in fact had a sense of being an epic but were actually quite intimate so that's what I set out to do. An intimate epic that's a fantastic description for for your novel The Absolute Book which I know was on many uh, readers best of list last last year and was is going to be published soon overseas and will attract a whole new range of writers. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. May I bring the, uh, our other two writers back now? May we bring back Peter and Sue? I'm hoping the viewers can see you. I'm really interested in what you have to say today. And I know that uh, we're running a little late, but I don't care because we are having such an interesting conversation. And I was thinking reading all three of your books that each of you in different ways explore notions of damnation and salvation. And I wondered, in, in cultures that are increasingly secular, is the concept of, of moral consequences to our actions palatable or, or plausible? Uh, Sue, would you like to talk about this first? Uh, oh, it's quite a curly one. <laughs> yes, um, definitely I set out, as I was saying, to, to give Henry VIII something of a comeuppance. Um, oh, gosh. Sorry, I've gone a bit blank there. That's all right. um, I think I was almost in both of my books, the sequel as well, I was also sort of including the concept of time and history repeating itself. Um, the same things occurring again and again. And I mean, this is very topical at the moment because all these 
these things that are happening, you know, the, the virus and um, the Black, Matter, uh, Black People Matter movement, they've all got recent parallels in history. You don't have to look too far back. And to me, it's, it's very important that we remember history, that we learn from history. Um, time kind of seems to go in loops. Um, and it's like what Peter was talking about things being slightly out of uh, out of reach and getting a sense of of something being out there and I think we're all you know people that um, see angels and so on we're sort of aware of something that we something beyond religion a sense of moving tr trying to be good um, sorry I'm not <laughs> I'm not as eloquent as the other two authors no no I think you're what you're saying is really interesting. I mean, Peter, can we can we pick up on that notion of of how to be good in a way? Is mm -hmm. is that something that you were talking about religion and ethics to, as you said, an increasingly secular author? Is that something that's at the core of what you're discussing? Absolutely, because what we what we're told all the time is that we are we're we're, we're not interested in morality. Uh, all uh, and, and morality is all relative, and we're also told that people aren't interested in religion. And what is certainly true is people are increasingly less interested, certainly in the developed world, in institutional religion. Um, but I would argue that some, a lot of that's got to do with the failings of institutional religion. Whether we go back to Sue talking about Thomas Cranmer, and his, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 these weren't wholly good men; they had other other motives running. Um, through to you know, my own church, the Catholic Church, at the moment, uh, where you know, we we have a rather remarkable pope, but we also have kind of cardinals going around covering up child abuse. So I think people are tired of the institutions. That is absolutely true. They're also tired of people telling them what is moral. And what they should do, um, you know. Classically, a, a Catholic church being a church. I mean, I'm sitting here as the man amongst uh, three other women. The Catholic church is run by men, and it spends most of its time telling women what to do with their bodies. And you know, most women are saying, "Mind your own business." To be polite, uh, and I, I'm completely with them. Ab absolutely. Uh, so, institutional religion is a problem. But, um, and I, I talked about the kind of big questions of suffering and death, and you talked about redemption and and, and salvation and, and all of those things. You know, we, we still are interested in those bigger questions. We're interested in what happens to us when we die. Um, we're interested in uh, a, a sense of justice. We, you know, we've just talked about Black Lives Matter. Uh, we talked about a sense of, we're interested in a sort of sense of justice um, in this world, but, but, the, but, but that is guided by some broader principle. And I think that is where um, certainly what I feel Angels is part of and some of the other uh, things that I've written about, and, and, and I think Elizabeth was talking about this as well, is that kind of, you know, we call it spirituality, which is a word that people slightly sniff at now. And there isn't really, there are all sorts of different words for it. But I think that's what it's about. People's sense of, of wanting to explore something bigger, whether it is as simple as, I mean, one of the, the, the huge things, and this is going on all around the world now, um, you see it particularly in Europe, North America, uh, you see it in Japan, is the revival of the ideas of pilgrimage. So people going on all these, but the Camino being the famous one in Spain, you know, 30 years ago, 20,000 people did it. Now 350,000 people do it every year. And if you talk to them, oh, no, 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 I'm not religious at all. Not religious at all. No, not interested in that. Oh, but I got a really special sense when I was there. It's that. It's exploring what these things are really meant to be about, as opposed to worrying about man-made, and I really do mean man-made, uh, kind of structures and rules. You know, morality morality is, is something we all have to make our mind up about. We're not going to be told, you know, conscience, all of those things. And Elizabeth, I mean, to go back to your phrase uh, that you just brought up around your book, I mean, it is about finding the intimates within the epic, isn't it? What are your thoughts about this? Oh, well, us, us, our increasingly secular society. I think that's, that's kind of an illusion to do with the conveniences of capitalism. It has, it has um, fooled us about two things, about, um, for lack of anything else, about our spiritual selves, that we might have a spiritual selves, and about our material selves, that, you know, in fact, but, you know, it's, it's, it's persuaded us about financial institutions and money and so forth, whereas the, the great mantra of the, um, the, the, the ecologists is talking about um, human existence as the shortest distance 
possible between the soil, your hands and your mouth which is deeply material, it's about food, it's about feeding ourselves, because that's, that's our goal. That's, that should be our goal in life is to feed ourselves and to look after each other. And so what I think is, I think that we're actually in a moment where we're changing, where our reverence for things is, is going to move to different places. And be, become less institutional, obviously, or begin to organize itself around um, human ideas or human institutions that we haven't, that haven't come into being yet. Um, uh, so I think, I think uh, we, we have, we've been persuaded to kind of separate ourselves um, from, from well, nature. And we have to start thinking us of ourselves more as animals in a material world that we have to look after. But our former ideas from, from the rest of culture about what, what an animal is as distinct from a human has to evaporate and, and, that, that, we, and that we don't have souls or they don't have souls. That all has to evaporate. We have to kind of start really looking at ourselves and each other and who we live with those those true others that we live among who are um other creatures yeah thank you very much elizabeth i like that notion of nourishment as well because we're talking about just physical nourishment but also i think something we've been discussing today is also about a spiritual nourishment or something that is beyond ourselves and of course, stories and books are part of the nourishment of our minds and of our imaginations and of our humanity. Um, I'm very sorry that we have to, to draw this to a close. Obviously, we could have talked all morning um, because the three of you are so very interesting. And I would like to remind everyone as well, you, you should buy all these books and you should read them all at once and then you should give them all to all your friends. So thank you so much to our writers today. Thank you to Sue Copsey. AKA okay, Olivia Hayfield. <laughs> been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, thank you very much, and kia ora to Peter Stanford. It's been, it's been lovely being with you, and I, I was looking forward so much to coming to the festival itself, but this has been a very good second burst. Well, I'm hoping that you can still come in the future. Thanks, as always, to Elizabeth Knox. Kia ora, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Yeah, kia ora. That was lovely. I really enjoyed listening to. to Sue and Peter, and that's just great. Thank you, Paula. Um, and so before I, I give my closing remarks and, and say bossy things, um, Sue, I just have a really quick question from you. That's from a viewer. Oh. Which wife is your favorite? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to be very boring and say the last one, um, who everyone thinks is the most boring of the wives, but I, I really like Claire, um, the, physical, the historical figure she's based on. Catherine Parr, um, I learned a lot about her and she was an incredible woman. So yes, I would say that she was my favorite wife. Catherine Parr, Lady Latimer, always reminds me of my mother's saying, better to be an old man's darling than a young man's slave. Uh, and on that note, um, may I thank <laughs> everyone who has made this episode possible, especially the Auckland Writers Festival team, Auckland Live and Copyright Licensing New Zealand. Kia ora also to the sponsors and partners listed on the, the festival's website. Thank you so much for your generous support. Now remember this episode can be viewed again on the festival website or tell you to view it. If you'd like a copy of the 2020 festival program, which is an excellent reading guide for the year, just contact the festival and they'll send one out to you. Please tune in again next week when our guests will be Ahn Yu with her intriguing debut novel, Braised Pork. The art critic, Anthony Burt, with his latest book, The Mirror Steamed Over, Love and Pop in London, 1962. And Maggie O'Farrell talking about her new novel, Hamnet, the story of Shakespeare's son. So see you same time, same place next week. Ka kite a te ra, ra tapu, hai re ra.